So I don't, I don't know if you guys won the lottery today or not, because I got to tell you, I'm, I'm like shocked to be standing in front of this many people, because normally my, my uh, audience amounts to uh, eight or 12 people uh, sitting in a box, and, and, and they got to call 30 of them to show up, right? And then at least 20 of them try to argue to the judge why they shouldn't have to sit there and listen to me, right? I mean, there's... Some, and then the, the ones who stay have to be paid to stay. So I'm just saying, it's just sort of a disclaimer. You with me? All right, if you fall asleep, I'm gonna throw this at you, all right? So I'm just, I'm just being up, up front about it. You know, I, I came today and, and, and David Reams, who was kind enough to invite me, said he was struggling with a real quandary, you know, this morning when he thought about me speaking. And he's like, you know, Christian, attorney, I'm like, you know, listen, attorneys get a bad rap. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, listen, you, you, I've, I've heard so many attorney jokes. It, it just, I feel like I'm a modern day tax collector. You know what I mean? It's just, you just know there are as many jokes about tax collectors in the first century as there are about attorneys right now. Some guy came up to me at the end of one of my uh, opportunities to speak. He said, oh, I, got, I got an attorney joke for you. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, listen, here it goes. He said, what do you call 100 attorneys that jump out of a plane without a parachute? And I'm like, I don't know. He said, a good start. And I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm just telling you, if your theology is not big enough to handle Christian and attorney, you need help. All right? Right? Jesus is bigger than that. Okay? Truly. So I was, I was, uh, I was asked to tell you why I'm a follower of Jesus. And I've spent three months off and on thinking about that because there's so many things that I could say. But here's, here's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm a follower of Jesus because I have found eternal life in him and in no other, in him and in no other. And I found that eternal life in knowing him. All right, I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to say this. It's not about me. It's about him. And it's about us. And that's the lesson that I want you to take today, because that's a lesson that God had to teach me in a very hard way. You see, you're looking at the end of the sausage making process. Well, hopefully not the end. Maybe I got a few more breaths. I got every one God's going to give me, right? And I don't want another one. But my life was not a straight path to being able to say to you that I have eternal life, and it's come in knowing him. My path started out as a young boy who grew up in a home. Many would say, yeah, oh, I, had, I grew up in such and such church. I grew, up, I grew up in a pagan home, okay? I grew up in a home where my parents didn't go to church. And though I, at an early age, began to ask ultimate questions, I don't know why. I think it was part of, part of my hard wiring. I, be, I began to ask ultimate questions like, why am I here? Is there a God? Why do I like Snickers bars? You know, things like that, real, real important questions at a young age. And, and so there was this drawing to something beyond me. So when I became a teenager, it was the first time I was introduced to Jesus Christ. It came about while my father was in Vietnam. My grandmother invited me to go to church with her on a Sunday night. Had nothing else to do. Went with her. Walked in the door. Says, kid, looked like he was my age with blonde hair, walked up to me. His name was Marty. He said, hey, listen, would you like to sit with me? And you know what? A 13-year-old really loves his grandmother, but would rather sit with somebody that was cool, right? So I said yes. Turned out his dad was the pastor of this church. His name was David Grubbs, and that Marty was Marty Grubbs, who's a pretty, pretty well-known pastor in the Church of God movement today. But I was befriended by him. I was invited to his home. I felt a place of belonging that was missing with my father away 
in a war. And I started coming to that church, and eventually I was there every time the doors were open, and they introduced me to this guy named Jesus. They gave me this paperback book called Good News for Modern Man. It was, it was a New Testament, and it had stick figures inside of it. You know, these like these little drawings. This was the day before what we have, you know, it was way back before what we have now. And, and so they said, take this home and read it. All right, so I take it home. I read it. The first four chapters seem to be about this guy named Jesus, all right? And the more I read, I was like, man, this Jesus guy is really, really cool. I mean, I felt like if people, I I remember sitting there thinking as a 13-year-old, people really live this way? It'd be amazing. So I go downstairs. I mean, we're back in the middle of of the days of Martin Luther King and the riots that are going on across the country and all of that. I know I don't look that old. It's okay. It's okay. But I really was alive then. And, and, and I go down and I tell my mom, Mom, you know what? I've been reading this, this uh, good news from modern man thing about this guy named Jesus. And here's what I, I, I really think that if, if he was alive today, he would be a friend of Martin Luther King. I, it seemed like they were saying similar things to me as a 13-year-old. And Jesus began to grow in me and seed within me what it was like to, in, in an early way, to begin to know him and to, to walk with him. But you see, Jesus was working on me, and at the same time, what's happening in me is, is I am, uh, I am a, a one of these, what you call, overachievers. My mom is a perfectionist. I remember I wrote a paper about the state of Ohio one time, and I had drawn some li- lines through words that I had misspelled and written the right word next to it. And after 12 pages of my best copying from an encyclopedia ever, okay, she literally looked at it and saw those two words with lines through them and ripped the whole thing in half. That's kind of what I said. But the reality was I lived in a perfectionistic home and I felt loved and valued because of how I performed. And so I did. I did. I did. I, I performed well. I, I graduated at valedictorian in my high school class. I, I went to Anderson University, I achieved, and da-da-da-da-da, and, and got all the things you typically get with that. And by the time I had finished that process, I believed my own press lines. I had a good case of what you commonly call pride. Oh, oh don't get me wrong. I mean, I was serving Jesus, right? I mean, I, I was literally working as an associate pastor while I was in college, serving Jesus but prideful. I married my college sweetheart, went off to become an associate pastor in a church, and within five years, my wife came to me and she said she didn't want to be married to me anymore. I graduated from seminary with a diploma in one hand and within 30 days, a divorce decree in the other. And my life, my life, what it was, came crashing down. Not only was this a threat to my personal life, but it was a threat to my vocational life. I mean, listen, churches really weren't looking to hire a lot of pastors who were divorced. It just wasn't what you put at the top of your resume. They wanted a, you know, a husband and wife, hopefully she could play the piano, and two kids that would climb the pews. I mean, that was sort of the... The scenario, right? I mean, and, and I, I, I didn't fit that. And the reality was, even though people were willing to, to come to me and say, you know, oh, your wife shouldn't have done this. She shouldn't have fallen in love with your friend. She shouldn't have, whatever. But the reality was, in the, in, the, in the dark moments at 1 o'clock in the morning, when I would, I would look at myself in my own eyes, I knew that it took two people to make a relationship, and I knew that I had been a horrible husband. I had treated my wife like she was property. I had treated her like she was there to support my ministry. My life was about me in the name of God. And now it felt like my life was over. And for the next three years, I went into a very, very dark place. I suffered depression. I suffered regular anxiety attacks. After a few months, I contracted mononucleosis and was just sick, sick. 
And I, it's hard for me to describe how broken I felt. And I kept praying out to God, God, I wanted God to intervene in my circumstances and do something in my life. I wanted him to, to change something outside, change the system, redeem this, fix this. I kept looking for things outside, but nothing was coming. It was like I would pray and my prayers would hit the wall and bounce right back down. But I remember the turning point. One night, I was living in a parsonage, and it was Christmas time. And I went to open my closet where Christmas decorations were stored, and I began to open them, and every one of those was a memory of my failure, failure as, as a husband. All of those lights, all those decorations had come when I was married, and I, couldn't, I just couldn't even put up a tree. And I went out to eat by myself. And when I came back that night to my parsonage and opened the door, there was light everywhere. People, friends, had come into that parsonage and had redecorated every corner of that house with new Christmas decorations and a new Christmas tree and new lights and new figurines and new tinsel. And, and, and it's like God literally spoke to me and said, I want to do this in your life. You've been looking out here, and I'm, I'm ministering to you through my hands, my feet, my mouth, my, my mind, my heart. The, the people who are around you, your brothers and sisters, they are ministering to you. That's how I'm reaching to you. And they are offering you something new, and I have something new for you. But you have got to get past yourself. And you will never get past yourself until you come to know me. Really know me. And so life got very simple. My mind was taken to John 17, where, where, where Jesus is literally within 24 hours of dying on a cross, and he's praying his high priestly prayer, and he's, he's asking God to glorify him as he glorifies the Father, and he's praying for his disciples who are about to go forth. And, and he says these words, he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And, and, and so it was like God said, listen, if you want to know life again, if you really want to know life, then I need to remake you into the image bearer that I intended for you to be. And you're not ever going to find that apart from knowing me. Now, the reality was I knew a fair amount about God, right? I knew about him but no more than I might know about George Washington if I read a biography and know about his life. And I had even done great things in the name of Jesus, right? At least in my mind, that was my press line. You know, done great things, but yet I can't get past Matthew 7 where people would say, you know, Lord, Lord, you know, we've done great things in your name. And he looks at them and he says, I never knew you. He was calling me to a different relationship know him. And the word, the word that he uses is a word that literally means to have an intimate relationship with. Uh, and, and not just any relationship, but, but to be the relationship in, in, in my life. That, that, that he is at the top of the food chain, if you will. You know those, those food chains from the Department of Agriculture and you got to eat this, you got to eat this. Way at the top of the pinnacle is knowing God. That's it, he says. And, and nothing else matters unless it goes through that. It has to be the filter for everything. Where I work, what I'm going to do, uh, you know, where I'm going to go to school. Everything I do literally has to go through that. But I was so stuck into thinking about me all the time that it was very hard, practically speaking, to, to do that. So I began to, to do something that Frank Laubach talked about. He was a missionary to Southeast Asia. And he came up with this idea called the game of minutes. And the idea was to begin to try to discipline your mind to develop a conscious, a conscious relationship with Jesus as you go about your day. 
So I began to literally intentionally try to train my mind just like I am right now. I'm looking at you. I'm literally looking at you, and I'm saying as I'm talking to you, Jesus, tell me what to say next. And, I'm, and, I'm, and at the same time, I'm saying, what is it, God, you would have me to say? I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this plane of communion right now in my mind. I don't tell a lot of people this because they want to give you medicine if you say you do this. But, but I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this at the same time I'm doing this. You got me? But with everything. And for me, that meant this. you got to get past your shame. You know, one of the things that, 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 um, one of the things that struck me about the raising of Lazarus was Jesus says, um, he comes out of the tomb, and Jesus says, take the grave clothes off of him and leave them in the grave. And being, being, being the perfectionist that I was, I was kind of like, Jesus has invited me to be Lazarus, but I'm kind of dragging my, my, I'm dragging my stuff behind me everywhere I go. Because if there's anybody who could beat me up, it was me. And I did it a lot. And one day Jesus said to me, do you really think you're that bad? I mean, you, you really think you're that rotten? You, do you think my death on the cross is not enough for you? Because you sure act like you got some bad stuff that I can't take care of. Because you'd be beating yourself up all the time, the way you're treating yourself, the way you're acting. Are you ready to leave those grave clothes behind? Because if you're going to follow me, you have to just look at me. You can't look back. You can't look back. You ever try to walk around looking back all the time? If you live in the future or you live in the past, it's always to the detriment of the present. Always. So Jesus invited me to this wild adventure. Listen to this. It's like, I just want you to think right now about what it is I might want you to do. I want to have that kind of communication with you. I want you to know when to look at this dear sister or, or when to look at the dean or what to say or where you're going to go next. I want to be in every aspect of your life. I want to infiltrate that, and, and you need to begin to discipline your mind to have that kind of communion. Say that with me, communion. That's what, that's, that's, that's knowing God. That is knowing God. I mean, when I got married the second time to my lovely wife, Sue, 31 years ago. Can I have a hand? There's hope. I mean, I got married again. God brought this amazing woman to me. But one of the things he told me at the beginning, he says, Steve, listen. You need to know her. You need to love her. And by the way, if you can't learn to know her and love her, you'll never learn to know and love me. Your wife is a tutor. Wow. That raises marriage to a whole different level, doesn't it? It was a tutor. So he said, I, I, need, you to, I need you to learn to develop this God-conscious relationship with me. And it means you can't be thinking about your junk. You can't be thinking about your accolades. You can't be thinking about anything. Because you know what? None of it matters. None of it. None of it. What matters is following him and doing the next thing he tells you to do. That got real simple. The other thing he told me was this. Your life's not over, Steve, because I want you to be my minister in whatever you do. I, 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 you, you, you were called to be a pastor that, that season, at this time, whatever, that's, that's, that's done. But, but your role as a minister for me has just begun. Because I need every single follower, every single disciple of Christ to believe within their hearts and to live with me in such communion that they will be a minister for me in whatever they do. In fact, I don't even really care so much about what you do as that you follow me moment to moment in what you're doing. So that's what I did. I went to law school. Some people said, you know what? You like to argue. You might as well get paid to do it. I'm like, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, if, you know, and said, so Jesus, you know, I'm like, okay, you want me? Yeah, okay, all right. So I go to law, so I'm starting over. I mean, do you believe, you know, three years at a seminary, I thought that was a long time, and another three years at a law school, I mean, 
What that means is I spent way too long in school, to be honest with you. But I go to law school and I, and I understand in a different dynamic how I can be in communion with God and the minister of Jesus Christ to those in my life. And so that's what I have made for the last 30 years of my life, to be the hands, feet, mouth, mind, and heart of Jesus to the broken person who's sitting in front of me. Because you know what? That broken person is me. That person that I am. Listen, you don't come to a litigator unless something's really bad. You don't go see a lawyer to, to, to go file a lawsuit or to defend your liberty unless something's really gone bad. And so God took my darkness and he said, I'm going to use it because I don't waste nothing. And I'm going to take you into some of the darkest places and I'm going to let you be my hands, feet, mouth, mind, and heart to those people. And so that's where I go. I go into the darkest prisons. I go in to help people. I go in to, to, to try to bring Jesus to them even when they don't know him. But two years ago, for example, a, a young man named David Clark who who was convicted as the age of 15 and sentenced to life in prison because he was alleged to have committed an arson where a young girl died. He was tried as an adult at the age of 15 and had been in prison for 32 years. He filed some papers with a federal judge who looked at them and thought, maybe something went wrong here. The federal judge calls me up and says, Steve, I know you're always looking for the next lost cause, so I got one for you here. I think this one might be worth looking at. So I read the briefs. I start digging in. And lo and behold, it appears to me as if he may have been wrongfully convicted. So I file a brief with the court seeking permission to reopen this case and to literally try it again 32 years later. I have to go out and hire the best private investigators I can find to dig up witnesses from 32 years ago. I have the judge who sat on that case so long ago who spoke to me and said she couldn't believe I was doing this. This person was evil incarnate, and how dare me do this? That just encouraged me more. <laughs> I fought with the state of Ohio for two years and ultimately proved that he had been convicted on the basis of wrong fire science. He did not start this fire. And so before the, you know, the week before trial, the, the state calls me and says, we will release him. And I go into court with a courtroom packed with people. And there's a young man who's been in prison for 33 years of his life now, who's going to go free for the first time. And Jesus said, that's you. That's you. Every single one of them. That's me. So I've learned that there is no life apart from knowing him. He made me in his image to know him. He wants to restore that image so that I can know him intimately and deeply. He wants to have this communion with me communion, this con God consciousness on a daily basis where I'm focused on him and literally I'm living moment to moment. That sounds crazy, right? I'm living moment to moment with what Jesus is telling me to do next. That's what makes me alive. It's the greatest adventure I have ever encountered in my life. There is no greater adventure than living that way. None. And God has set me free following in the dust of his feet and he's setting free hopefully the people that come across my path each day now here's what he wants you to do he wants you to know that it's not about you it's about him and it's about us and he wants you to go out of here today understanding that he wants to know you intimately but a relationship takes it takes this. It takes communication. It takes consciousness. He wants you to begin to develop the brain discipline to think about him and to bring him into every single aspect of your life. 
And when that happens, you will find it will transform your heart. You will begin to think the thoughts of the Holy Spirit. You'll begin to hear the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You will begin to do what God tells you to do with your hands, your feet, your mouth, your mind, and your heart. You will join the great adventure in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Father, it's all about you. And we know, we know, Jesus, that we will never find eternal life apart from knowing you. So, Jesus, would you mold us and shape us? Would you, would you continue to show your great mercy and graciousness to us and, and knock on the doors of our hearts and our minds and never stop until we, until we yield to you, until we live in daily communion with you so that we as parts of your body can work as one synchronous unit to accomplish your purposes here on this earth, the kingdom of God now and the kingdom of God yet to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray.